First and foremost, thank you, um, Mr. McDermott, for the welcome to, the, uh, to this um, Algonquin territory. Um, all the words this morning have been very um, inspirational, and I think we're you're gonna hear from an amazing panel. My name's Anita Bromberg. I'm the executive director of the Canadian Race Relations Foundation. Uh, it's an organization that came out of the Japanese redress agreement. Um, it's a crown uh, corporation. And what, what I find inspirational about the foundation is um, um, yes, our task is to do the impossible, to cure find that cure, that elusive cure for racism. But um, the Japanese community understood that if we were going to even find that magic pill, it would be through the of bringing communities together um, where we all have a shared responsibility to counter racism. Um, and we do it through dialogue through uh, furthering the aims of human dignity, a term that I heard uh, repeated a number of times this morning, and I do think that's at the root of what we're, we're all seeking. So without uh, further ado, um, I'm going to invite your uh, panel to come forward. Uh, they can rearrange if they so wish, but I, um, we have your name uh, plates there, so please come forward. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, the theme for this second panel is, I'm still too close, aren't I, is um, reconciliation. Uh, clearly, um, the, the, we have some uncomfortable realities of past wrongs, um, particularly regarding one of the founding nations, the indigenous nations of this country. And thanks to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, we have a clearer picture of how measures were taken in the past as part of a coherent, systematic policy to eliminate Indigenous people as, as distinct peoples in order to assimilate them into Canadian mainstream against their will. Aboriginal spiritual practices were outlawed, spiritual leaders were jailed, sacred objects were confiscated. And the residential school system, which was the focus of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, was clearly based on the assumption that European civilization and, if you will, Christian religions were superior to those of the indigenous culture that had survived and, and furthered um, well-being here in, in these lands. Um, and certainly hostility to indigenous culture, spiritual practices conti has continued, continued well into the 20th century. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission certainly um, takes a good look at all those and, and brings that reality forward for us. And, and when I, one of the quotes that I saw in the Truth and Reconciliation um, uh, report that, that frames my thinking is, is the following. There is an emerging and compelling desire to put the events of the past behind us so that we can work towards a stronger and healthier future. Um, and one that acknowledges the injustices and harms experienced by the Aboriginal people and the need for continued healing. I do believe we're on that path of reconciliation with the goodwill of the many in this room and in other gatherings that I've been in. And we've been, um, the organizers have brought to you uh, three panels that will help us explore that path forward. Um, first, if I may, I will inv uh, introduce to you um, Karen Joseph. Um, she is the CEO of, of uh, that's her, um, is, she's the woman on the panel. Um, she, she is um, the CEO of uh, Reconciliation Canada. And I'm going to mispronounce this, so please correct me. She's the proud member of the... Kwakwakiwa. Say that again. Kwakwakiwa. There she go, people. And brings more than 18 years' experience in inspiring diverse partners to collaborate towards effective, positive change. Um, the, and, and many events have taken place under her direction, and I welcome um, Dr. Joseph at the back of the room, I invite you to to listen to his uh, remarkable um, comments on the CRRF website, little plug, and, and elsewhere. Um, truly, they understand the spirit of, of reconciliation and can bring much to our conversation. Um, Prof 
Professor Douglas, um, I am not doing this in the right on, uh, order, but nonetheless, Sanderson, managing, was managing editor, editor of the inaugural edition of the Indigenous Law Journal, while still a student in the JD uh, Law Program. He later earned his LLM from Columbia as a Fulbright Scholar. He's a member of, and again, I really apologize, I should have practiced this. Cree is really easy, it's just sound it out. The Cree, I got the first part. Oh, Pasquea. There we go. I'm, gonna, I'm going to learn these and come back next year. From 2004 to 2007, he was a senior advisor to the government of Ontario um, in a number of important roles. And from 2007 to 2009, he was a research fellow at the University of Toronto Faculty of Law. Um, his research areas include Aboriginal and Indigenous law, legal theory, as well as private law and public and private legal theory. And then we welcome, and least, uh, most and not least, Bishop uh, Mark MacDonald. Um, uh, he became the Anglican Church of Canada's first national indigenous bishop uh, back in 2007. Have you now hit your 10-year record? There we go. After having served um, as the Bishop of Alaska for the, uh, t another 10 years, he's the North American President of the World Council of Churches. So the hearings and report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission have certainly helped Canada on a path towards reconciliation. And I think while we're along the path, we have to continue to explore what spirituality and faith or religious communities can bring to the conversation. I, I took a moment to note what the Interfaith Conversations uh, has done on this uh, topic, and I welcome you to look at the website where uh, they address the several calls to action in the truth and reconciliation, taking a look at uh, the call to recognize the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples as that framework of reconciliation. So this interest is not new to the interfaith conversations by any means. Um, what what um, they note is that reconciliation is fundamentally a spiritual process that needs to be accomplished first and foremost in the hearts of all Canadians. So. We're going to ask um, the panelists to um, take about 10 minutes each. When you, when you get to about the two-minute mark, I'll, I have some sign somewhere that I'll hold up. So if you just sort of look in my uh, direction. And there, there's sort of, there are three broad questions that we've asked um, you to address. Number one, in view of the role of the churches, the, or in view of the role the churches uh, have played in, in the residential school story, how should they now contribute to the process of reconciliation? And broader, what are, what are the uh, responsibilities of other religious communities in Canada? Secondly, how should Aboriginal spirituality inform our conversations about reconciliation? What can you tell us about that? Are there different traditions of thought and practice about reconciliation within the concept of Aboriginal spirituality? And the third area that we'd like to explore a bit and have your insight into is what kinds of values and principles will help us to live together in unity? Um, we have till um, uh, 2.45, so we'll have a good period um, for questions and answers after each um, address us for about 10 minutes. And I think you're gonna see that they've each in their own way thought about um, spirituality. I, uh, Karen, you're, you're quoted as uh, finding a new way forward in relationships that has potential to change the very soul of Canada. And Professor Sanderson, um, you talk about th that corrective justice means much more than just the land, but, but it is a return to values and recognition of them. And there's some very interesting pieces that I took the time to read. And Bishop, um, you've, I quote, I see uh, some of your writings about that this is a particular time as we move along the path to renewal of the spirit of the people. Um, and we, and um, I think that each of you can lead us into an understanding of what uh, religion and spirituality can um, um, help as we all try to walk the path and uh, look at the wrongs and move forward. So um, is there, it's up to you in what order you'd like to address it. 
we can draw straws. <laughs> yeah, there are some. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Niti Kini san Amo Panashi, a misk nida dem. Uh, my Cree name is Amo Panashi. It means uh, hummingbird, and I'm from the beaver clan of the Opaskwayak Cree Nation. <clears throat> I want to thank you for that kind, kind introduction and for having me here today. I have to say that I feel a little, um, uh, a little underqualified in a room full of people uh, of various faiths. And sitting next to uh, a bishop of the church, um, you know, I do not have a lot of church experience. Um, when I was young, my mother would take us to church sometimes, um, usually only ever on Christmas Eve. And I remember, you know, I'm reminded today of walking to the church in the snow for the midnight mass and how warm and comforting that experience was. And how it struck me as odd that we just did it once a year, and also how tired I always was and wanted to get to those presents. When I reflect on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report, for me, the takeaway, the single greatest lesson, the most important thing to learn, is that the residential school system happened and continued to happen because indigenous cultures were felt to be less valuable, less worthy of respect, less worthy of dignity than settler cultures. And the result was a coerced assimilation. But in fact, and in truth, and this is all, this is easy to say, but it's hard to wrap your head around. Indigenous cultures are rich and valuable and vibrant. They're beautiful cultures with beautiful languages that developed over thousands of years to describe the physical and spiritual relationships of the land upon which we all still live. These were cultures with complex philosophies and cosmologies and scientific methodologies all the time now, the stories and legends of First Nations people turn out to reveal scientific fact. There's a story about how the Thunderbirds come in the spring and they rock the earth and wake the ground up. And it turns out when the Thunderbirds come, when the thunderstorms come, those, clashes, those claps of lightning, they release nitrogen and that wakes the soil. We've had a scientific methodology of understanding the earth for at least 10,000 years. Recent discoveries suggest more like 100,000 years. Our people have been here since the creator laid the first person here, since time immemorial. And what happened in residential schools was a crime and a tra travesty. There were, of course, assaults and rapes and children being starved for the purposes of science. But I want you to think about First Nations communities during the time of the residential schools, 100 years. When you walk down the street and you pass a school or a playground and you hear those children laughing and playing, that's a benediction. Those sounds were not heard in our communities for 100 years. And we learn as people how to be parents, because we have parents. And so for generations, indigenous communities didn't learn the lessons of how to be a brother, or a sister, or an auntie, or an uncle, or a father, or a grandmother. In my own experience, my mother went to residential school, and my father uh, went through the um, child welfare system. And I have to tell you that they were not good parents. They didn't beat us. You know, they stopped that cycle. In their generation, they stopped that. And they fed us. 
And our houses were immaculate, constantly clean. That's what they learned to do in residential school. They learned to clean. And so they expressed their love for us with the tools that they had. Clean house, roof over your head, food. But we didn't talk. We didn't play. We didn't interact intergenerationally. We just kind of were in the same house. And as a result today, I'll be honest, and it's terrible, but I have trouble taking joy in playing with my own children. I had no experience of that as a child. It's better they're older now, and they're more like you know, little adults, and we can have conversations. But I have difficulty just playing with them. My wife, uh, who's uh, you know, uh, Irish, Scottish descent, that's sort of uh, generic across Canada, uh, <laughs> she's a fantastic mom. And my kids are, you know, they're better than great. They're fantastic kids. And it's largely due to her work. I mean, I help out, but I have to credit her. And I, have this, I was reminded of this story uh, this morning. Thank you. Um, but I, I took a bunch of Aboriginal students to uh, a moot, like a, a law contest of sorts. And uh, we were in Edmonton. And I, we were having lunch, and I called home. And it was still winter time. There was snow on the ground. And my wife told me that she had taken the kids to the park and had brought uh, little cups and, uh, like, tang and made snow cones. And I related this story to my students. And they laughed. And one of them said, that's great, she must have learned that from a magazine. But she didn't, because her parents didn't go to residential school. This is a generation of First Nations, <coughs> Métis youth, who are learning to parent from parenting magazines. The result of that experience of not learning to parent and to be good brothers and sisters, to be a strong family again, uh, results in poor parenting. And I'm not going to lie, the child welfare system is racist in many ways. Child welfare personnel make policy choices that disproportionately affect indigenous people. But at the same time, our families are really still broken. My parents' generation, I'm lucky, they stopped the generation of violence. I'm learning, struggling to learn to talk to my children, to have fun with them, to enjoy them as other human beings. And I will succeed. They'll manage a lot better than I did. But we've been very lucky in that regard. And so when I reflect on, you know, what can the church do? What can other religious organizations do, faith groups do? I think the answer has to be that you have to learn to respect our cultures as equal partners. And that's, that's a big ask. You've grown these many years with these preconceived ideas about what our communities are like what our religious and spiritual practices are like. But you're mostly mistaken. And this is a really big ask. It means you can't do this in the pews. You got to get out into the community. You have to find opportunities to interact with our communities. You know, it's time you learned our languages, not just learned how to pronounce the words. And it's time to learn that, too. Right? These are small things, but they're important things. You know, for generations now, we have sent our best and brightest to your law schools and to your med schools and to your child uh, welfare factory schools. But it's time that you came and learned our ways. How else are we going to have a relationship based on equality and respect and dignity when there's an absence of knowledge about our communities. It's not up to us to teach you. It's up to you to learn. 
when I ask my mom, um, who I, you know, I have a really, we talk a lot now. Of course, we never talk about residential schools. We never did, and you know, occasionally we'll talk very tangentially about it, but her experience was brutal. She was taken when she was three. She experienced all kinds of violence and assault. And she carried that with her for so many years in silence. And most First Nations people did. But my mother and I, we talk now a lot. I mean, we share academic interests. She also works at a university in northern Manitoba. Again, I say northern Manitoba, but it's only about a third of the way up. Manitoba's really big. <clears throat> and when I told her I was coming, I said, well, what do you think I should talk about? She said, I don't know. And then she emailed me a couple days later, and she said, I think that it's incumbent upon the church and faith groups to help out our communities with the child welfare system. For years, our children were taken into the care of the church with results that were disastrous for our communities. And she thinks it's incumbent upon you now to find ways to help get our children out of that system. There's more children now, indigenous children, in the child welfare system than there were in the residential schools. 70% of kids in provinces where indigenous people make up maybe 5 or 6% of the population. It's astounding. What that help looks like, I don't know. But again, it's not up to me to tell you. It's about, it's up to you to learn. But I also want to share this. Before my mother went to residential school, uh, she lived for much of the year on the trap line. I mean, she's not a really old woman. And in two generations, I went to Columbia University and became a law professor. Now I'm here talking to you. That's a remarkable bit of change for communities like ours to sustain. But we're doing it. And you know, the sun is going to explode in two billion years, and my people will still be here. And so will yours. And somewhere between now and then, and it's going to take a long time, we're going to have to learn to treat each other's communities with the respect and dignity that they deserve as equal peoples, with valid philosophies, with beautiful languages, all of which is not given by blood. It's given by spending time with people, by learning from them about the beautiful things that they have to teach you. And so I encourage you to find opportunities to engage with First Nations communities and indigenous people and find ways to help them and to learn about them. Thank you. Miigwech. I greet you all as relatives. I'm using the uh, Ojibwe dubitative form of relatives, meaning that I, I'm not sure that we are, <laughs> but I hope that we will be. So let's be relatives. Let's act as relatives. Fifty years ago last year, uh, Martin Luther King gave his I Have a Dream speech. It's a pivotal moment in the relationship between African Americans and the rest of the American public. It's a pivotal moment in many ways for other people as well. What he did in that speech was to pivot from making the case that a great wrong had been done to looking at what society could be like in the future. This is a, 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 great, a great moment. He had made the case that a great wrong had been done, but up until, that, up until that point, nobody felt 
that there was going to be any substantial change in the relationship for decades, if that, if that much. But what he did in uh, 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 a genius uh, event, uh, he, number one, portrayed that all people, all Americans, had a stake in a different future, that everyone would benefit from that, fu that future, and everyone would be happier in that future. And number two, and this is, I think, very significant, he found the seeds of a better future in the midst of America's racist past. He was able to point to the words of people who owned slaves to find the words to translate what a better future would look like. It's, 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 a, it's a remarkable achievement, a remarkable achievement. And I would like to argue that we're at that kind of pivot ourselves. Um, people like Elijah Harper, like Chief Robert Joseph, others have made that case, but have also begun the pivot towards reconciliation. We see in their, their words and in the work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, specifically the 94 Calls to Action, we see the outline of a of a better society for all, based on justice for Canada's first peoples. We also see that in this time it has been discovered, and uh, the, the work of Jonathan Ralston Saul is a part of this, that there was a different past, that the seeds of a, of a better future are also in our past, in the Royal Proclamation of 1763, in the first relationships and the first treaties of friendship, you see a much different picture of what the future could be like, and that's for us now. I'd like to ask the question, what, what do religious groups have to say and do in this pivot? Well, the first thing to notice and to note is that um, Reconciliation begins when an oppressed people reclaims their humanity. A man named Robert Schreider has studied Truth and Reconciliation Commissions around the globe, and he says, as far as he can tell, there has never been an instance where someone who was an oppressor decided to become better. In fact, what happens is those who have been oppressed, those who have been victims, become survivors. And when they become survivors, there is something in that dynamic that kicks off the truth and reconciliation process and, and brings people to reconciliation. That's where we find ourselves today, and the religious groups find ourselves in, in a very unique place, just as Martin Luther King found himself in a unique place. I think we find ourselves in a unique place in Canadian society. First of all, we must become places for truth-telling and accompaniment of those who have been victims. That, that is essential. Second of all, we must become places where people can imagine and discuss a better society, of the, the kind of society that we want our children and grandchildren to live in. And third, this is most important, we must be places of repentance, places that are willing to acknowledge their own wrongdoing, either by complicity in things like the residential schools or complicity and silence to the ongoing oppression of indigenous peoples in this country. It is critical that we become places of self-critique that allow us to look at our responsibility. In, in this way, in this way, we will, we will become 
a place that in which a new society can be born. Now, Jorgen Mulkman is a, a Christian theologian, and he once said that the churches were the tail light on the caboose of the train of social progress. <laughs> I'll say that again. A tail light on the caboose of the train of social progress. That too often has been the case. What we're being called to now is to be the headlight, just as Martin Luther King was the headlight, just as our elders have been headlights for us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, those were strong words and strong messages from uh, my colleagues up here. Gela Kesla nas namuyu nuko am konwatagilis. Uh, as, as the bishop mentioned, I, I uh, recognize you as relatives, and um, I acknowledge uh, the unceded territories of, of the Algonquin peoples, and, and thank you to you for, for allowing us to be here and for welcoming us into, into this sacred space. Um, I think that uh, when people don't necessarily understand when you have somebody come to welcome you into the territories, it's not, uh, it's like a welcome into your home. It's like a welcome into your, it's not just a welcoming, it's, a, it's an acknowledgement of sacredness to the, to the conversations that are about to happen. And, uh, and, I'm, and I'm really honored that, that you would do that in this space and, and prepare, the, prepare the ground for us so that we can have these important conversations. Um, <clears throat> my name is Karen Joseph. Uh, as mentioned, I'm, I'm the CEO of Reconciliation Canada. And I always like to kind of joke around and, and say, uh, when, I, when, I, when I introduce myself, I'm the eldest daughter of Quin Quin Quili Gedzi Wakyas, who is uh, the hereditary chief of our people and, and one of the founding uh, grandfathers in Canada of the reconciliation movement. And so I get the title of CEO simply because he's the visionary and he's my father and, and like any other eldest daughter, he, he's, I've got this great idea. Okay, can you make that happen? <laughs> and so that's my role. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I'm really honored and, and privileged to, to have that role and that responsibility within my community and, and as things have happened within uh, Canadian society at, at, as a whole. Um, you know, when I, when I think about spirituality, it's funny, I had this, I like to go last because I always have this speech ready and then the other pe people speak and then I, then I really can get into what I'm talking about. But, you know, I had this um, thought, uh, but I'm the, I'm the daughter of two survivors uh, of the Indian Residential School. I'm, I'm of the age that uh, I actually should have graduated from, from a, a residential school. And so, um, and so many of my friends have gone through that history. And as a result of my father's experience, uh, we were raised off reserve, right across the street from the reserve, but off reserve. And that was an important distinction in terms of safety for, for us as children. And, uh, and it makes me privileged. But we also went to church quite regularly. And, and that's the, the interesting thing for me is that's where I learned all of the negative attitudes and mis, misperceptions about myself as an Indigenous person. Um, I remember, uh, you know, sitting in church with, um, with my, my younger brother. And I was probably six, and he might have been five or something. I mean, you, you know, you're verbal, but you're not really astute in, ter in terms of your skills. And so I remember being in Sunday school and, and uh, the person who was leading the class said, um, does anybody understand what a heathen is? And my brother put up his hand. And, uh, and so he asked him, well, what does it mean? He goes, I am. And, and that was the message, loud and clear in those schools. Unlike other people, 
uh, who were brought into the churches at that time, and, and you know, in some places probably still today, the idea was that the precursor to you as being indigenous was you were heathen. And so, and unlike other people that you would come pure and clean into religion and, and hopefully live in that way and then uh, make uh, atonement for any sins that you committed during your time, if you're indigenous, you came in as a heathen. And hopefully if you lived good enough and did good enough and, and acted good enough, somehow you might then become uh, clean enough perhaps to go into the hands of God. And so that was a, a really clear message that, that we received um, as, as young people. And the other clear message that we received uh, from the churches had to do with, um, as, as was mentioned earlier, the inadequacy or the inferiority or, or the blasphemy of our own cultures and our own religions. And, and so, for me, as I, as a child, I was always very thoughtful about that. As a matter of fact, I moved away from the church uh, because of that, because I thought, what God in their right mind would characterize a whole race of people in that way? And, and I couldn't fathom that concept. And so there was no place. And I think the really important piece of this was that fundamentally, the residential school system severed our connections to our own sense of spirituality and used spirituality in the guise of religion as the knife from which they would do that severing. And so unlike uh, uh, African Americans, for instance, who clearly are, are taken away and, 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 and have that, that slavery, uh, ex slavery experience, their resilience actually is strongly founded in their, their um, ability to relate to Christian values. And that's where a lot of their strength and their resilience comes from. And so when we hosted the Walk for Reconciliation, in Vancouver in, in 2013, we actually invited uh, Dr. Bernice King, who's the daughter of Dr. Martin Luther King, to come and speak about uh, reconciliation and the movement uh, that was started um, with their walks uh, down south. And so for me as a person who, who lived in um, both the United States and in Canada, that was something that just came crystal clear to me was the difference between the resilience that was able to be afforded to uh, other communities based on their foundation in spirituality or religion versus the complete severance and disconnect from indigenous people where religion is concerned, where spirituality is concerned. Because ours clearly was insufficient and inferior and, and the wrong track, yet this track was was the cause of so much harm in our communities. And you didn't need to be verbal or astute or, or, or be able to pontificate in great words and languages to understand that as a child. And so we left all of these children af adrift with no spiritual foundation because this was not good enough and this was not welcoming. And so that, for me, really began my own journey of, of reconciliation, about trying to find a way to reconcile those two narratives. And, and so when I was thinking about the message I, I wanted, to live here, wanted to leave here with today, is reconciliation, as, as, as was mentioned earlier, becomes a new spiritual covenant that we have with one another. And that it, it becomes a place to which we aspire, not a place to which we arrive. So it's not a, it's not a checkbox activity. It's a, it's a life way 
It's a way of life. And just like the good book can provide us some guidance as to how we live that life and to define some practices that we can engage in in order to ground our sense of spirituality. I think reconciliation and some of the calls to action can be a framework, not even a, not even a book, but a framework. Maybe the, maybe the beginning pages of what that new covenant can look like for us as peoples living together on, on these earths. And um, those, are, those are really, uh, that's the place from which I start. And I, and I think about spirituality and I think about religion. And I oftentimes hear people say, oh, reconciliation is a long process. Of course it's a long process. It's a way of life. If it becomes a way of life, it's something that you move forward on. You kind of fall back a little bit. Then you move forward. It's just like your own spiritual reality. You don't, you know, uh, you don't reflect the face of God the day that you believe you're going to believe, right? You, you spend a lifetime trying to improve yourself and trying to recognize when you've done wrong and trying to make restitution for that wrong and trying to, to get better as you move forward in this world and recognize the way we impact those around us. And so just like religion and just like spirituality, reconciliation, that commitment to reconciliation can happen in an instant. And from that time forward, you begin to commit yourself to a life of reconciliation, to a life of acknowledging the fact that each of us is, has our own ways of expressing our connection to, to Creator, to God. And each of us has our own practices that allow us to make that connection easier to our, our God, and, um, and that each of us has a lifetime of doing that. And indigenous people have their own practices and their own uh, cultures, is the way community calls it now, that allow us to form those foundations and I think are, are a really important contributor to how we move forward as, as a nation. And, um, and, and I think that uh, it, it becomes critical for the churches uh, to begin to embrace that, not, not just for the point of reconciliation, but just for the, the point of expanding uh, your own sense of spirituality, your own sense of connectedness to God. Um, because I believe, and I don't know if this is controversy or not, but but this is how I believe about religion. I always thought that God was something separate from me and that there was this, this uh, entity that held the answers or held the thing that we were all searching for. And then as I began to explore my own sense of spirituality, I started recognizing that, yes, there's this, this great thing outside of us that's larger than ourselves, but God also exists within, that I'm, I'm an expression of God. And so my role in life is to kind of keep that light alive, to not extinguish that light, to try to share that light with others. And, and you can call it love, you can call it spirituality, you can call it lots of things. But that's fundamentally my role as a spiritual person, is to recognize namuyut, which is a which is a value that every First Nations had. All my relations, we hear that very flippantly oftentimes in in our conversations today. But that is a fundamental way of being. That is a that that's a covenant that we make to one another, not because. Uh, we all recognize that we're relatives and that it's all a kumbaya state that indigenous people live in, but we recognize that it's our responsibility as members of societies to acknowledge that what I do impacts you. And similarly, what you do impacts me. And so when we're in these grand gatherings together, we have to start making decisions that recognize that we lift up the whole 
that, that we show up at our highest selves. You know, there's some mornings where you wake up and it's like, this is gonna be a bad day, right? I'm tired, I'm grumpy, I don't have the right food, my coffee spilled, like pick, pick whatever. It's like, this day is not showing up well and you don't show up well as a result of that. And then there are some days when you're bounce out of bed and it's like, oh, this is a blessed day. The sun is shining. You know, my house is nice and clean. And oh, everything's beautiful. My kids came in to kiss me this morning. You know, pick it, pick, pick that day. And you show up differently that day. And you can express love and you can express your connections to one another. And you can be intentional about that. Your work day zooms through and life is great. And that's us being at our highest selves. And the challenge for us as spiritual people is to how do we maintain that from day to day to day to day, in spite of all of the things that, that come and face us. And so I think for me, those are the, the thoughts that I have around reconciliation, that it's a way of life, that it's a spiritual covenant, and that each of us can take, make that instant commitment to it and recognize that it's going to be a lifetime of learning and that there's joy and that there's peace in that process. The biggest thing for me, especially as an Indigenous woman with the history that I have, is finding first and foremost, nakokla, peace within. Because that's when I'm at my greatest self. That's when I can express my own sense of spirituality in ways that are impossible to, to ever show up with. And so uh, I really thank you for this opportunity to be here today and, and to share a few of my thoughts on reconciliation. Well, one thing you know is that I don't lie because the, the, we couldn't have asked for a more so many insights. I didn't know what to tweet to tell you the truth. Um, so, I, without further ado, I, 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 I can only imagine that there's questions abounding. So, if you'll, um, we have about 20 minutes to take questions, um, and then I guess the break that follows. So, first hands up. I see two there and three there. So perhaps you and the woman at the back, and then we'll turn to you. Professor Sanderson, I was fascinated by your comments about uh, using languages. Uh, one of the best uh, spiritual lessons I ever had was when I worked with a, uh, a man from the Sitsika Nation uh, near Calgary. And we, were, and we had an assignment where we had to review a bunch of names, and the names we were reviewing were from Holland. And as you know, Dutch names, they kind of miss a lot of consonants, or a lot of vowels. They kind of jam a lot of consonants together. And, and he was doing it perfectly. I mean, he, he just had it. And this was a man who had a grade three education. And so I inquired of him, I said, can you do this because the Blackfoot language is like that? And he said, no. He says, I look at the name, and when I see the name, I feel the person and then I say his name. I think any of us who have learned another language realize that you can say some things in one language that you just, it's not possible to say. I, I speak two languages. My second one isn't very useful in this country, but I can say things and think things in that. And so I'm fascinated by that. I'm just wondering how can we how can we do that? There, there's many beautiful languages, and I listen to them. I've just, when I heard you speak here, I thought, wow, I like that. That's pretty. That's beautiful. But I don't know. I'm not trying to learn some Arabic words, and I'm having trouble. So. <laughs> what, what can we do? Um, yeah, indigenous languages are, uh, they're beautiful. And they are not widely spoken, but they are taught. Um, in Toronto, uh, the University of Toronto teaches uh, Ojibwe and Haudenosaunee languages. Uh, the Native Canadian Center also offers Cree and Ojibwe uh, language instruction. And so there are places to learn. 
Um, I don't think it's, uh, I think it, it's a challenge, to, it's always a challenge to learn, and it's always a challenge to see the value in something abstract. So on a personal level, I think there are places, but there's a political level too that I think is worth exploring um, and talking to our political representatives about the way we say kind of glibly sometimes that we're three founding nations, and yet we have official languages acts that only respect two languages. And uh, I have a cousin out at the University of uh, Winnipeg who, uh, like me, is also a lawyer and a law professor. Um, and she's beginning to think that maybe that's a Section 15 equality challenge. But you know, the courts are not the best ways to resolve these things because in many ways these are political issues. And so uh, there's a guy uh, at the University of Toronto as well, uh, Irvin Student, who's a friend, and he's said for years that we should teach indigenous languages along with French uh, and English in our school system. We should grow up learning it. Doesn't, you know, my kid's in French immersion and uh, he's actually pretty good. He's, you know, in grade four, but he's all right. Um, if we can do that with French, you know, we can do that with indigenous languages. Um, I went to high school in Northern BC and I stopped taking French in grade nine, so I have like 200 words of French uh, in the simple present tense. Uh, but it turns out I can communicate with my son in French. And so even under the worst of possible language instructions, Northern BC is not the place to learn French. Um, it's possible to learn enough as a young person to be able to carry on simple conversations and then to begin to understand how those languages conceive of the world. The reason that you can say things in some ways in one language and not in the other way is because that language views the world in a particular way absent in the other language. And coming to see how indigenous languages describe a particular view of the world is an extremely valuable way of according that equality and respect and dignity to indigenous cultures uh, that I spoke about earlier. So, okay. Anybody else want to respond? Okay, then uh, please. My name is Nazira Sharif. I am from the Ottawa Muslim Women's uh, Organization. Uh, on the 30th of April, last Sunday, we had a dinner. Uh, it is called the Festival of Friendship Annual Dinner. And our keynote speaker was Dr. Cindy Blackstock. And Barbara Hill, whom I have known for more than 25 years, she, was, she did the Algonquin opening prayer for us. And we had throat singers from, from the North, Inuit, and we had um, uh, food dancer, Winter, the upsetter, and we had the junior dancer, Maya Karindu, and it was an excellent uh, program. We learned a lot from Cindy, and I learned a lot from the two of you today. I just want to commend you on the speeches. They were just absolutely wonderful. And the Ottawa Muslim community is with you. All the way. We have been trying to do this dinner with 
your community for the past two years. We tried to get Justice Sinclair three times. He was very busy. Now he's a senator, he lives in Ottawa. Yeah. Hopefully we'll get him up here. Yeah, but we haven't succeeded. But we, we have been trying and trying to work with, with your community. And we, are, we respect you and we admire you and we hope you'll get justice one day soon. Absolutely, and I think the grain of the question there is how can we make sure that every community across Canada is part of this conversation? So, uh, Thank you so much for your comments, and I, I just want to um, comment on the image of the, uh, uh, the First Nations man on the horse. So I think that one of the things that we all have to do is we all have to learn history in a substantial way, and you know, you were taught stuff and you were lied to. <laughs> and the horses arrive with the Spanish. They're not indigenous to our culture. So the, the whole version of the Plains Indians on the, on the horses and you know, robbing ponies and stuff, that is a kind of Indian that results at, after contact. So it's a beautiful image. And you know, Indians are, you know, we're modern people, right? So we adopt new technologies like everybody else. So when there's rifles, Let's get a rifle. If there's a horse, <laughs> let's get on those horses. Right? We don't have the leather. Let's we'll, we'll do this without a saddle. Um, so, so tied up in that, I think, is one is this, uh, this is this image that we have of Indians in history that is largely mistaken, but it's also, I think, a story about indigenous modernity and how we have always been your modern contemporaries, the, today and in 1500. And that's, try and you know, hold that in your minds <laughs> that we are and always have been a, a modern people. I'm, I'm reminded on uh, one trip I took, um, I was privileged to be taken on a trip up to the Dene Nation in northern Manitoba. And, uh, they um, told us that they were going to be, you know, they were going to honor us with some music, and out came the most amazing equipment I've ever seen. And I, they sort of looked at me, "What did you expect? Drums? You know? <laughs> okay, good point, fair <laughs> point. I stand corrected." I, I think. Uh, thank you for thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, one of the. Uh, goals of, of Reconciliation Canada in particular is to engage with the multi-faith community. Um, a lot of our uh, ability to impact change has come with partnerships through different communities and engaging people in those kinds of conversations because this is a, this is a, this is a spiritual conversation and it is a spiritual and it is a conversation about our shared humanity and and what kind of future do we want to create tomorrow based on which values and so those are those are very important conversations and we're always uh, uh, interested in in partnering with different organizations to make that happen so yeah. I'm, I've seen two hands are there now I see three I think we'll probably be able to get three more questions if we do, we'll try to sneak in a fourth question. If you could sort of be to the point so that everybody could have a few moments, and then I'm sure our speakers will share with us uh, during the break. So we'll try to get the four in, and I'll just be mindful of the clock as the break time is coming. Um, so one, two, three, four. Hi, I'm Routine, I'm from Vancouver. The snow got out there today. <laughs> Um, I, I want to actually verbally say that I commit to reconciliation. And I apologize for my ancestors, like if they have participated in any of this, their ancestors. But um, my question is to Karen and to all of you, I suppose, a couple of um, close friends who are indigenous and, and many in my community, but two in particular that I had some deep conversations asking what I personally need to do to help them personally. We talked about generally as a society and growing, but what can I do today, tomorrow, to help them heal? They don't know, mm -hmm. and I don't know. So I don't know if maybe you have a insight for me. I guess the, the first thing that, that always happens uh, for me 
is that inward journey. As, as we mentioned, to, to understand the history, to, to, to question, to, to observe what goes on around you in your own society. And when you see those misperceptions and those, those misunderstandings come up, and, and to question what is your role in that, and, and perhaps even what is, how do you benefit from that. Um, when it comes to healing, I guess there's probably another message I would, I would like to share with you. And, and uh, the professor brought it up earlier. We grew up with the same history you did. We went to the same schools. The same racist attitudes that you believe or were taught or misconceptions were taught to us. Mm -hmm. And many, because of the, um, the incidents of, of being in care and being removed from our families, many of our young people in particular have no idea where they came from. They couldn't tell you who their families are, and so they don't even know necessarily that they need to heal. They just know that they hurt as a result of what's happened. I'm in a privileged few, there's a double-edged sword to that, in that I actually participated in both of my parents' uh, hearings within the residence. So I know their stories. And uh, I'm an inquisitive sort, so I also ask my grandparents their stories. And, um, and so for me, that's part of the reconciliation process, is understanding the history and internalizing that in a really deep way. And then questioning every day, how am I showing up in this relationship? How do, I, how do, how do my own misperceptions and miscommunications translate into our relationships? And so you may not be able to do something particularly for those individuals, but recognize that all of us need to heal from this. And that healing is an internal journey. And if you commit to that, then we're gonna move somewhere in reconciliation. And, I, and, I, and I'm gonna say this now, I was gonna say it later, were you at the Walk for Reconciliation in Vancouver? Well, you have another chance. So September, September 24th this year, uh, in the city of Vancouver, we're going to host another Walk for Reconciliation. And we're, in, we're inviting national participation. So if you're here, we, ha we, we have our fingers crossed on, on the speaker, who, who will be somebody as incredible as, as Bernice King. Um, and uh, we're, we're when, if you don't know about it, the Walk for Reconciliation in, in Vancouver brought out 70,000 people in the pouring rain. Uh, as the way it can only rain in Vancouver, and, and which is torrential. And so we're, we're hoping to do, to do at least that this time, this time round as well. So, yeah. so and, it, and it has its own transformational experience. I, that was one of the, for me, one of the most moving days in my life, because I had always heard that people were interested in reconciliation, and I had never, to be surrounded by that many people who were willing to stand for that many hours in that much cold and that much rain because they were committed to showing how much they cared was a it was a deeply transformative experience for everybody who went there. So if you can, if you have the means to be there on this day, I, it is its own experience. So, Ella I'm sorry, just a, just on a smaller scale, there's, there's something um, that you can just look up on the internet, um, something called the blanket exercise which yes. you, we do it at the law school now, and we train law students. My, my wife's Mennonite friend uh, did it. She's become a facilitator. She, you know, she's at the law school six times a year now running these things. They're deeply moving. They're, they teach history. Uh, it's easy to become a facilitator and to help other people understand history and understand the experience of what you call settlement, but <laughs> which we experience differently. Um, but it's a chance to experience it differently. Um, and it's easy to do, it's easy to become a facilitator, and I encourage you to look into it and, and to do that. Um, my question, uh, 
uh, is uh, that uh, in Manitoba, the University of Winnipeg, we now have uh, a rule that all students must take one course in Indigenous Studies, any course, and there are many that, uh, to choose from, um, in order to um, take the degree, whether it be any field. And um, I'm very proud of that. And I wondered um, if uh, you feel that um, this is something that all universities should adopt, because I think that students uh, across Canada do not have uh, a grasp of uh, Indigenous uh, history. Um, and, uh, so, and may I ask, uh, um, if you can ask your question? Sure. Okay. Benjamin, my question is about the, the role of um, maybe the possibility of political advocacy from a religious perspective. Is, is, there, is there any room for an interfaith political advocacy on behalf of Native peoples in Canada? I understand that the emphasis is always on we need more education, we need to learn our history. It's a long process. But parallel to that, can religious leaders in the country, does it sound like a good idea, the leaders especially, get together and try to support, invite native leaders and say, hey, we want to empower you, we want to help you, we want to be together on this political struggle that it is too, for land claims, for conciliation, and, you know, bigger picture things. Is there any room for political solidarity that religious leaders can contribute as well? And certainly those two questions have a related theme of call to actions and next steps, and one being more education, and one is uh, finding that active voice within the religious community. So. Um, and you, you, sir, your third question. Yes, um, uh, I want to um, follow up on Professor Sanderson's suggestion about engaging more with the Aboriginal communities. And uh, I live in Cornwall, so we engage with Mohawk people on a number of in a number of different ways. But I can't say that I have ever been in a situation where I'm directly talking about or asking questions about residential schools. And I wonder if you have any suggestions about how to Right, so here we are. It's a good way to close. Um, let's ha we're, we're looking for the 95th call to action. What, what would, we, f we have suggestions, education, mandatory education, maybe not just at universities, two more uh, opportunities to speak out using um, the religious community as a route. And third suggestion is help us understand more ways that we can find opportunities to engage. Perhaps if, if you could each take a, a moment to sum up on, the, on that notion. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be very, very quick. Um, so I think on um, cooperation, then yeah, absolutely, I think there's room, and I, I had talked about languages, but I think you're right on all kinds of issues. Uh, there's a lot of room for political cooperation. Um, I think a mandatory course in undergraduate is uh, very important, but I think it also, it needs to be supported starting in kindergarten and all, all the way up. It's hard to get kids to like take a mandatory course when they think they know things and they don't know anything. But if we start early, and then that can be a really interesting and engaging course in a way that I think it's hard to make it interesting and engaging now because the bar is so low for people to learn. Um, and uh, you know what I would do uh, is I would, if I, were, I would go out to Six Nations and they tell their creation story over four days in the fall. Every year they do it in uh, English and in the Mohawk language. And I would experience that as a place to start. Before talking about residential schools, learn about the people themselves. And that will provide, I think, opportunities uh, for dialogue. Um, at the last uh, World Parliament of Religions, there was a small uh, but important indigenous presence. And a book came out of that called A Seat at the Table a seat at the table. It is, I think, important for religious groups particularly to provide a seat at the table and to insist that there's a seat at the table, um, not just in religious discussions, but 
but certainly in religious discussions and then beyond. So uh, I guess I would just uh, underline a seat at the table. This can be taken a number of ways uh, by a number of different people um, and, and, and potentially is quite controversial, but at the same time, it's a strong belief uh, that we have within our own territories. It's proven quite effective. So I, I come from a very isolated uh, little community uh, on the north coast of, of British Columbia. And one of the ways that people started getting their language back actually was through translating hymns into indigenous languages and actually singing those within different congregations. And so that actually led to our, our local religious leader learning the language and then hosting the opportunity for other people to learn the language within that context. Uh, and so centering the learning under sp the spiritual beliefs and contexts, I think is a great way to, to achieve two goals. Uh, it, so you're kind of revitalizing that language but you're also learning some of those spiritual practices. And of course, you can't learn that language without having the interactions with the people. So the creation story is, is a great idea. How can we translate those creation stories or even share those creation stories within our congregations to acknowledge that deep history and that deep connection to land? Because you're right. I mean, you know, I, I, I get to work with systems thinkers all around the world. And they're astonished at my ability to grasp those concepts relatively easily because it's inherent in how we practice things. And I think the spiritual conversation is exactly the same. It's, it's inherent in how we conduct ourselves every day when you come from those traditional ways. And so there's much to learn. There's, much, there's beautiful conversations that you can have about understanding of spirituality, your understanding of religious doctrine, your understanding of theology, like there, there's so much interplay in there. And if you, you can just approach them with those conversations and then maybe talk about the harder ones, right? So, yeah. Well, um, on that note, it leaves me to um, say, and I'm gonna get this right, miigwech. Um, but that's one of many, many words that we need to learn and understand. Um, but uh, thank you all for, um, for participating in this session, and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Hamilton.